thanks for joining us. It really is a pleasure, and we've had uh, enormous and very rewarding feedback already. Um, if you didn't join this morning, uh, then bear with me uh, for those who were with us, because I need to under underscore that this is about connecting climate ambition, emphasis on connecting climate ambition and net zero innovation for a green recovery. And we're at the start of the London Climate Action Week, um, digital as it's being called, and Nick Maybe, the co-founder of E3G, the CEO now, uh, was here earlier. Uh, he's running the London Climate Action Digital. So he was here to really send us on our way three or four hours ago. We have three main <coughs> themes policy, innovation, and investment. And we'll be tackling investment towards three o'clock this afternoon. Let me just give you a couple of thoughts about climate action itself. Um, established in 2007, uh, its digital and live platforms build stronger partnerships between business, government, and the NGO community. And it's never been more needed than now, particularly with the incredible pressures that there are on sustainability and the climate emergency. And secondly, this is a place where you as either stakeholders or partners can really share knowledge, to share solutions and expertise in order to uh, identify practical solutions to the challenges faced by climate change and this transition to net zero. So uh, we have to be grateful to certainly the two lead uh, sponsors, the industry partners, let me therefore name EDF and Zenobi. And we also have a number of other institutional partners, uh, and I hope uh, that you can see them there on the screen, led by CDP uh, and IEMA and LWARB uh, plus UK SIF, uh, and there they are up on the screen. Let me give you some housekeeping now, because the richness this morning was as much because of those who were sending in questions, therefore leaving me with less to do, which was great. But it helps focus on the kind of value that there is from these kind of discussions. So let me tell you how you can ask questions and underscore that this is now being recorded. And you should also visit the virtual expo for exclusive access to industry innovation and insights. And please do network and connect either now or after we finish in a couple of hours time. And you can subscribe for updates to climateaction.org. So here's how you can ask those questions. First of all, go to your control panel and click on the Q&A. Secondly, type your questions in the Q&A box, or maybe just an observation if you want. Start each question, if you can, with who you would like this to be addressed to. It helps us in the limited time we have available, and for John as well. Please let us, let us know um, which organization and where in the world you're from as well. You can also use Twitter, which is climate action, at climate action, uh, climate underscore action underscore. Please use the hashtag, uh, hashtag CIF UK, C-I-F UK. And remember to include the speaker's name or all if you're addressing it to everyone. And please mention the organization you represent. Let me underscore at this moment, time is limited. So please, if you've got something burning on your mind about the sessions coming up, then please let's hear from you now that we can make sure, John and I, that we get this into the discussion right from the top as opposed to at the end and realizing we should have asked that question, but we didn't have any time for it. So do please submit your questions now. I've mentioned John. So John Elkington uh, joining me now. Uh, come to the stage, John. And what we'd like to hear before you introduce your guests is the work that you're doing on not white swans or black swans, but green swans. Over <laughs> to you. Thank you, Nick. And, and um, hello, everyone. Um, the green swan idea is very simple. If uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb's idea of the black swan was about negative uh, exponentials, things that take us very rapidly where we don't want to go, green swans are the reverse. They think they're trends, trajectories, particularly in markets that take us where we do need to go, whether or not we want to. So that's the theme uh, of the new book. Thanks for asking. And is it getting good traction? Because it's such an important and really seismic kind of perception here at this kind of time of a green recovery, a, re a recovery which is led by green, not by returning to the old legacy way of doing things. 
Well, luckily, um, with all the bookshops closed and so on, it was a rather idiotic time to launch a book. But nonetheless, uh, we did early in April. The FT did a very nice uh, review of it. And then it's, it's one of the things that's changed so much in, in doing books is that around the world, people now take these Instagram and otherwise photographs and send them from, you know, whether it's Toronto or it's Turkey or wherever it is. Uh, and it, it, the pickup has been quite extraordinary uh, so far. Um, but anyway, we've got some panelists to go through. Yeah. And, uh, Over to you, John. <laughs> Nick, thank you. And, and again, thank you uh, to you personally for your uh, work over the years in driving climate action. So um, a couple of uh, quick thoughts from me, and then I'll go straight into our panelists and introduce them before I invite them uh, to speak. I, one of the things I find fascinating at the moment is to see how the discussion is shifting from the shape of any recovery, is it going to be V-shaped, U-shaped, W-shaped, L-shaped or whatever, to its quality? Is it going to uh, build back better, uh, not simply build, build, build as some uh, would have it? Is it going to be job friendly? Yes, I'm afraid. Is it going to be newt friendly? And critically, is it going to be climate uh, friendly? And we'll get into some of that. And particularly, uh, we'll be looking at the ways in which uh, businesses and governments can increasingly work effectively in partnership to drive investment in low carbon uh, industries and innovation. So we have three panelists. I'm going to invite them to take about five minutes each. I'll ask each of them one question after their presentation. We'll try and keep that short as well uh, in the interest of getting to the wider uh, Q&A. And so our first panelist, and I'll introduce all three uh, uh, up front, so is Sir John Ahmed, who's chair of the National Infrastructure uh, Commission, which is an independent body advising government on the UK's long-term infrastructural uh, needs. Uh, secondly, we have Simona Rossi, who's CEO at EDF UK. EDF uh, is committed to leading the transition to cleaner, low emission electric uh, futures and supporting customers as they improve their own energy efficiency, all in the interest of pushing towards net zero. And then thirdly, we have Nicholas Beatty, who's founding director at Sunobi Energy, already mentioned. Uh, he, Nicholas has a financial background uh, and has been a pioneer in the deployment of battery technology in support of solar photovoltaic uh, farms. So, so, John, if I might uh, start with you and invite you to uh, share your thoughts. OK, <clears throat> thank you very much, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so speaking as the National Infrastructure Commission, Two years ago, we published an assessment of the infrastructure needs of the UK going through for the next 30 years. We did that against two fundamental criteria. Um, one, economic growth, and the second, the obligation of the UK government to meet the various uh, uh, agreements it had entered into um, with regard to uh, reduction in carbon. Subsequently, of course, um, the government has increased its commitment to zero carbon by 2050. Uh, and, of course, we've now gone through COVID. So does this make any difference to our fundamental um, objectives? Well, I would argue it uh, doesn't. Sorry, the, if we can go on to the first slide. Um, fundamentally, I don't think it does. Um, it simply accelerates uh, the need for us to focus on the recommendations which we made with regard to, to, to green technologies, zero carbon um, is fundamental. COVID, I don't think, changes that. It simply increases the, the pressure um, on us to meet these um, the zero target um, objectives in decarbonizing power and heating systems, <clears throat> the mass deployment of proven and cost effective uh, technologies necessary to meet those targets whilst keeping consumer costs down and keeping open the option of a highly uh, renewable generation mix. Um, what we've seen recently with the decongestion during COVID, I think, has simply raised people's awareness of the benefits of having cleaner uh, and clearer air. If we could go on to the next uh, slide. Um, I wrote to the Chancellor back in May supporting short-term stimulus measures, such as prioritising full fibre broadband rollout, energy efficiency, retrofitting, EV charging infrastructure as key priorities with potentially quick results. Um, building a strong pipeline of um, contract and different auctions uh, in offshore and onshore uh, power generation, adopting our ideas of a national standard for flood resilience, 
improving the energy efficiency of housing stock. Um, we recommended two years ago that there should be 21,000 measures a week by 2020. And here we are in 2020 and nothing really has started except the government has in the last couple of days talked about it. So that's that's some progress. But the economy fundamentally runs on confidence and it's the private sector and private investment that we fundamentally need uh, in the long term. The government invests primarily in road and rail. Everything else, all our other utilities are in fact supplied by the private sector. So we need that confidence and that requires the government to set out its uh, strategy that it's going to support the private sector. So we need to push on with deciding, how, are we going to use hydrogen in the future? Is hydrogen going to be an option for us in terms of heat? Or are we going to be rely, reliant on heat pumps? We need some full-scale um, projects and trial projects to take place. We need to make this decision in the next three or four years. If we don't, we will not get to zero carbon by 2050. And moving on to uh, the third slide. Um, all the point I would make here is that um, we talk about concrete and steel all the time as being what is required for, for infrastructure, but actually we've got to think about the regulatory environment and the need for resilience uh, in, against future disruption. We recently produced a resilience report which called for transparent service levels of resilience. This means government has to set out what it expects from infrastructure in terms of resilience and then direct that towards the regulators so the regulators can work with industry to ensure that we can provide the right resilience um, that's necessary. If we're going to benefit from uh, continuing cost reductions and product innovation in renewable generation or electric vehicles, then the government has got to set out its policy and attract by setting out a policy, by saying what it expects, you will start to attract private capital. But without a strategy, I do not see how the private sector can be expected to just invest in the hope that government regulation, government direction is actually going to create uh, an opportunity in the future. The fundamental thing that is missing at the moment is a, an energy strategy from government. Um, and that is absolutely fundamental if we're going to start to make any progress um, towards a much greener uh, future. So I'll stop at that point and because uh, I know time is uh, of the essence this afternoon. So thank you. Thank you, Sir John. And, and maybe I could ask the first question and that it's a slightly political one. You've talked about confidence. You've talked about a, a measure of progress being that those 21,000 measures per week are at least being talked about now that rather than being delivered. What single action by the UK government this year would give you confidence that we could develop an effective energy strategy and deliver against some of the things that you've just been talking about? What's, well, the government simply has to decide what its strategy is. Yeah. It has to say, is it going to go as it has in, at the moment, the strategy is, or with respect to Simone, is a significantly, a strategy which is, has a significant contribution from nuclear maybe half a dozen at least, new nuclear power stations to replace the existing aging fleets. We have argued that, in fact, you can have one which is probably dependent on maybe two, three new nuclear power stations. But at the moment, nothing is happening on nuclear because the government cannot decide how it is going to share the risk um, with the private sector on investing in new nuclear. And it has to get off the pot and make that decision. It also has to get with industry and say what it is going to do to help get to a point where we can make a decision about hydrogen. Is hydrogen, what is the future for carbon capture storage without some full scale tests being taken forward rapidly, which means the government engaging with the industry to come to an answer and set itself a date. By 2025, we will know what we are going to do. It is risky, but if it doesn't make those decisions, we will not be able to put in place the infrastructure that's required to get to zero carbon by 2050. Well, well stated. And, and Simona, I'd love to have your uh, views <laughs> uh, next. I, I think Sir John has actually set up a number of issues that we'll no doubt come back to in the full Q&A. But if I may, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, it's a pleasure uh, speaking to you today. Uh, I, I was thinking about the climate change issue, so uh, I think we've all read in the uh, news uh, about this uh, 
obscure town in Russia, uh, north of the uh, Arctic. You know, it's called Verkhyonsk, where 38 degrees were recorded on the 20th of June. Admittedly, it's the first day of the summer. So it's a great way to start the summer, and they get 24-hour days sunshine because of where they are. Nonetheless, uh, uh, looking at the track record of the first six months of the year in this uh, area of uh, Russia, uh, the temperatures on average have been six degrees above uh, the average of the period 1979-2019 for six months. So this, uh, uh, if at all required, brings home again the challenge that we face, um, not just in the UK, of course, but globally in terms of uh, um, Unfortunately, we have disrupted the way in which the climate of our planet regulates. We've got to act. I, I think it's very, it's very simple, but we need to remind ourselves every single day what our purpose is or is going to become. Our purpose is going to become, you know, to take action in this and to take action big time. Um, so the, the UK has committed to go to net zero emissions. Just as a reminder, net zero emission doesn't mean that we resolve the problem. We just stop the problem for becoming worse, and we do it as a UK. We need also all the other countries to do the same. Uh, so it's a huge task, but one that I personally find extremely motivating and extremely uh, passionate. Um, <clears throat> uh, I have to say that the Committee on Climate Change has explained to us that in the UK, if we want to achieve this net zero, we need to quadruple the low carbon electricity, more or less, that we produce compared to today. And they've also stated very clearly that the lion's share of this increase will come from renewable sources of which the UK is gifted, uh, particularly in terms of wind, but also on sun, and together with batteries, etc. cetera, uh, they can do, a, a, you know, really a very good job. Um, we as EDF invest a lot on renewables. We have uh, about one gigawatts of wind farms installed uh, and more projects underway onshore and offshore. We've also invested in batteries. We have uh, um, one of the largest uh, battery storage sites in the UK and two more under construction. But we also have partnership with companies such as Zenobi and, and others uh, that are, you know, building or have built their own batteries, and we work together to optimize the, these batteries, recognizing the importance of storage. We have uh, recently acquired a company called Podpoint, which builds and installs uh, charging points for electric vehicles, which are, uh, in in our view, another fundamental pillar of the <clears throat> of the new system that we that we are building for the future. Uh, but the Committee on Climate Change also reminds us that uh, some level of firm uh, um, low carbon power will be needed. And uh, to echo uh, Sir John's uh, points, maybe there are questions about you know, how this uh, firm low carbon power is going to be produced over the coming decades. What we know today, however, is that uh, uh, nuclear uh, is... Um, certainly not a brand new technology that's a minimum we can say although uh with the current plants it comes in a new and safer form uh and nuclear can deliver firm low carbon power uh, reliably with a technology that works uh um, maybe in the future new technologies will uh you know be proven to be able to work at scale and eventually offer alternative and potentially better solutions. But for the time being, we know that nuclear can produce vast amounts of firm low carbon power and can certainly contribute to this, uh, to this challenge. Uh, so we are building our nuclear station in the UK in clip point C. And I think we now uh, see a slide on the page. Uh, and, and sometimes people say, OK, what's happening with these investments? Well, one impact is that they create a lot of jobs uh, locally, and uh, and they create jobs where the station is being built. That's you know um, uh, uh, pretty straightforward. But also up and down the country, um, uh, this page shows you, for example, a picture of uh, of one of the factories uh, that uh, we are setting up. Uh, and um, uh, our um, uh, maybe it was the previous slide still, but uh, it was uh, 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 Bill Finger, a company that works for some of our piping things. 
350 jobs in Humberside, Warrington, uh, Bristol, and Somerset. Oh, the, um, that's a one, and the, and the following one with the with the with this person curiously um, laying down on the floor to weld. Uh, apparently, it's uh, the way to do it. Uh, but this is Darkham, a company based in Stillington in the northeast of England. Uh, they've got a contract for 90 million pounds to produce systems for Inkley Point C. We've just picked a couple of suppliers. There are many more. Actually, in the UK, uh, there are 2,500 firms of all sizes, many small ones, which are in the supply chain for Inkley Point C. Uh, and, uh, and in total, uh, the amount of jobs created through the lifetime of the investments is about 25,000. So I think these are also attributes that we need to consider uh, because probably they are particularly desirable in a context where the economy also needs to create, let me say, jobs at the same time. Uh, and last but not least, uh, also for the apprenticeship, uh, can we turn to the next page, please? Uh, just a, as a reminder, we have uh, uh, hired, trained 644 apprentices um, so far in Inkley Point, and we expect to achieve about 1,000 of them in all kinds of trades. Um, so um, now this is, uh, this is about Inkley Point. Uh, my, I'm going to finish my presentation to say that uh, we hope that when the new strategy for energy is going to be published by government, because we are all waiting for, waiting for Godot, but what, at some point it will appear and we will know whether you know, new nuclear will continue to play a role. Uh, it may be that the government will say, OK, build one more station or build 10 more stations or build three more stations. I don't know. Uh, whatever they're going to say, we very much hope to have a, a compelling proposition uh, through building a replica of the Inkley Point C design in Sizer. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, project is uh, very advanced. It already has a known design, which is a very rare um, uh, uh, circumstance in nuclear to, to start building when you know already what you are building. Uh, and uh, that's a benefit of building not a prototype, but a second of a kind plant. And it would uh, build uh, on the very jobs and skills that we are now rebuilding. And this would allow the replica power station also to become less expensive to build. It will remain an expensive object to build in absolute terms, but it will be less expensive than the first one it would create also uh, a little bit of a fleet effect as some critical mass for the country to have alongside renewables, which will be the bulk of the new future, you know, a solid base uh, of uh, thermal carbon. And uh, we see this very much as a no regret because in the future, maybe there will be other technologies and opportunities. Uh, but for the time being, you know, we need to act. And I think we need to act now. Uh, let's not uh, let's make sure that the country doesn't miss this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Simona. And I'm sure I'm not the only one to detect a slight note of frustration in what both you have said and and Sir John has already said. So I'm going to ask you a question around energy strategy. I mean, you're CEO of EDF in the UK. EDF is an international uh, energy player. Where in the world do you see a country? And there's no such thing as a an ideal energy mix, I'm sure. But where do you see a country that has really embraced energy strategy in a way that you feel that the UK uh, could learn from? Well, I have to tell you, honestly, I think that the UK so far is probably amongst the best countries in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, just keep in mind, we have a diverse mix at the moment. Over the last, uh, you know, uh, 15 or 20 years, this country has grown its... Uh, uh, GDP by, say, two-thirds. Uh, at the same time, it's cut its greenhouse emissions uh, like in half. Uh, yeah. and, uh, the, and the incredible success of offshore wind is unparalleled anywhere in the world. So I think, you know, Britain, first and foremost, should be proud. We should be proud uh, of what has been accomplished so far. Uh, of course, um, I've learned now, having lived in Britain for some time, that, you know, in Britain, we always like to be a little bit self-critical and, you know, <laughs> and concerned and always see the glasses half empty, etc. But we do have an incredible track record to build on. And, and also the fact that we had the courage to start Kingsley Point. Uh, it's another 
you know, courageous decision. So I think that as a country, we absolutely have all what it takes, and and we just need to to get on with it and to and to you know write the next chapter of this energy strategy. And I think you know the skills, the energy, the innovation. Uh, um, it's uh, it's uh, really unprecedented. What I can see from EDF uh, presence in other countries, uh, uh, I, I cannot think of, of a country with the same impressive track record of the UK recently. Uh, what we can say today, you just take a snapshot of other country and you see, well, Sweden and France are two countries where the emissions of CO2 are really very, very low when it comes to electricity. And this is thanks to very historic cho uh, choices. You know, they have uh, lots of uh, hydro production, which is very helpful. They've invested also in renewables such as wind and solar, but they are not, let me say, the most advanced in this area. And they have a sizable nuclear fleet. And when you combine those things, uh, they make it for a very, very low carbon generation. So probably okay, so, so, so Simona, can I... this would be something similar. Fantastic. You've, you've, you've cheered up my uh, afternoon considerably, and I'm sure you've done it for many other people in the UK, at least. Let me just um, now turn to Nicholas. And um, battery technology is obviously at the forefront. I mean, it's central uh, to uh, the sort of the energy side of uh, uh, hopefully sort of green uh, recovery. Tell us your story and where, where do batteries uh, potentially fit in? Thank you, John, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Um, I wanted to just give an idea of perhaps at the other end of the spectrum of um, how important we believe it is for entrepreneurial energy companies, smaller ones, to take a role in developing the UK to meet the net zero requirements and talk a little bit firstly about our own business. Uh, my part, two partners and I founded the company slightly over three years ago, so not um, very long ago, and we focused it on as you say, owning and developing a portfolio of grid-connected batteries, uh, which provided services to national grid balancing and power services. What's been very interesting for us, that whole progression has now enabled us to um, use those batteries and the knowledge and the technology that we built up within our company into a much wider range of um, applications. Can we just go to the next slide, please? As you can see from the slide at the bottom left, um, what we've done is we've developed our business using the battery technology and understanding there to support customers in the decarbonisation of transport. And I'll talk more about that later. But obviously, that means the acceleration, particularly of the take up of electric buses, um, adopting technology to optimise network infrastructure solutions, which is the core element of, of applications for batteries so far, and also using batteries to support commercial and industrial customers um, and their use of renewable generation on their own sites. What's been interesting as well is that in order to achieve that, uh, we've had to originally finance that uh, by raising money from private investors and then subsequently, because institutions wouldn't invest, but then subsequently raised money from a US infrastructure fund. And then in 2019, we raised more money from JIRA, which is a joint venture between TEPCO and Chubu, the two largest generators in Japan. Uh, we've also uh, been able to arrange about £45 million pounds of debt um, through that uh, from Santander and NatWest. And in both those cases, the form of the debt that we've developed have been um, absolutely a first in, in that structure in, the, in this sector. And we built a team of over 30 people who have a wide range of experience and knowledge from data scientists, engineers, uh, specialists, asset financiers, operators, software development, and now have a portfolio of 75 megawatts of batteries. And that's described at the bottom right of the slide here. So can I have the next slide, please? So what we've, if talking a little bit about the decarbonisation of fleet transport, clearly uh, surface transportation, as everybody knows, is one of the largest emission generating sectors here in the UK and its carbon dioxide uh, emissions has made relatively constant over the last 20 years or so. Um, the adoption of zero emission vehicles is absolutely crucial in accelerating the reduction of this output and buses are a key element of this and that's why we've started by working with bus operators um, to help them meet their challenges. This has very uh, positive uh, social benefits. Our solutions for bus operators enable them to deploy more electric buses than they would otherwise 
Um, and they have two key problems that we help them with. One is the high costs of the upgrading of the electrical infrastructure in the depots to meet the much higher power needs that are required to uh, charge the buses in order to meet the route requirements compared to obviously the diesel, which was solely for doing the pumping and so on. So we finance, install and operate the charging infrastructure to support these operators. We also finance uh, the battery on the bus and the bus. And we look at the bus as two components because obviously we're a battery company. Um, and we provide the battery, the bus to, to the customer through a service charge. And that service charge um, is effectively paid for by the savings that the operator makes by running an electric bus compared to running a diesel bus. So there's positive environmental benefits that almost pay for themselves. Then the other side of the coin is that we, we also take the battery off the bus when it doesn't meet the requirements of the bus operator any longer and we replace it and we take that first battery and we put that into second life application. So we extend the life of the battery, providing further environmental benefits. The key thing from our point of view is that our service is an end to end service. So we link that with the bespoke software that we developed. Also, our financing structure increases the attractiveness of these services to our customers as they enable us to partner with local authorities and Department of Transport to support their grants in this sector. And we're seen as a match funder and a facilitator for the deployment of more electric buses by taking that government money and making it go further. Can I have the next slide, please? On the network infrastructure and grid connected battery side, um, the original business of grid connected batteries continues to be a big focus for us, uh, particularly where new markets are being developed. As you will know, the forecast uh, generation share of renewable generation will rise from about 46% to 80% in 2030. And this will generate a major demand for batteries to be able to balance and provide services to keep the balance on the system. But there are also new markets opening up such as the need for reactive power um, and constraint management. On the reactive power side, using again the technology that we've developed within our business, uh, we are very pleased to be able to say that we secured the first reactive power contract from National Grids um, uh, in June this year, and we'll be building a large battery to provide that reactive power service to them. This is the first in the UK, and we believe it's the first in the world where a battery has been connected to a transmission system. And that brought together again all the different services within our business, the understanding of the technology, but also being able to do uh, the software and the financing capability to make the bid the best bid. Can we go to the next slide, please? Obviously, we're talking about services that we're providing our customers. And I'm sorry, some of this is <laughs> very uh, small on the slide here, but clearly there are enormous environmental uh, benefits that come from the services that we provide uh, to our customers. To give you an example, average buses operate for about 150 miles a day and emit carbon dioxide particulates and uh, nitrous oxide as diesel buses. Estimates show that for the replacement of a diesel bus with a zero emission bus, that will remove something like 770 tonnes of carbon dioxide over the estimated 15 year life of the vehicle and save 300 kilograms of nitrous oxides. The increased installation of renewable generation that we've been discussing is forecast, um, requires storage in order to optimize the use of that type of generation. And again, there are estimates that show that the forecasts are between storage going from four gigawatts up to about 23 gigawatts in 2050 to enable that more efficient use of re the renewable system. And then the third point I've got on this slide is going back to the, my comments about second life batteries. We see that as being a very key part of our focus as a business. All bus batteries will be recycled as the environmental benefits of reduced carbon dioxide are significant. Being able to delay the recycling of those batteries um, will probably reduce um, the carbon emissions by something like 75 tonnes per megawatt hour. And that will obviously apply to the hugely increasing um, automotive battery market as well. So if I can have the next slide, please. So to conclude, um, we believe that small companies um, have a very important role to help the UK meet the net zero requirements. We can be very much more nimble and we can uh, address emerging issues 
and applications very effectively compared to some of the well-established businesses. But we need to be supported and encouraged by the government by changes in specific areas. We believe that decarbonisation of transport is key, with e-buses and e-fleets at the forefront of this need. And the government needs to have a coherent plan to support the strategic bus sector and drive lots of different social benefits from that process. Consultations, which are very long term sometimes, need to be shortened and need to reflect the changes that are ongoing. However, the speed of change in the markets, which I've demonstrated by the different applications that we have for batteries now, often make this very difficult. So regulations need to be flexible and need to be able to accommodate changes, and the market will then determine the application of technologies. Reduction of cost of capital, we've talked to, Sir John's particularly talked about this as being very important. As I mentioned earlier, we couldn't raise money when we started our business from the city, we had to raise it from private individuals and we actually ended up raising over 20 million pounds from them. And we were very fortunate about that. But the reduction of cost and capital is very important if we're going to attract private capital into these new and emerging businesses. And sometimes we feel that shorter financial savings from short term contracts uh, result in increased through life costs, for instance, in reducing the, the contracts that are around the FFR market and something like that. Whereas if you had longer term contracts, you could actually get bigger amounts of debt and, and reduced equity costs associated with those longer tenor contracts. Overall, and to pick up uh, Simone's point, um, we believe that the UK regulatory environment in this sector is extremely well structured and is a very good base for the future. Uh, we think that this can help companies develop services here and that we're in a very strong position to then take those services and take what we've learned in the UK and export those skills, particularly supporting home-based operators and manufacturers. And that's particularly in the case of the US of the of the bus industry, which I've mentioned earlier. But that does apply elsewhere. We can then Thank learn goodness. from that and develop Thank you. Um, opportunities outside the UK. Thank you very much. And you've been very uh, specific about some of the things that you um, uh, want to see government and others doing. Now, uh, I'm in the invidious position of having uh, now less than seven minutes uh, left uh, for this session, and I'm going to hold us uh, to time. We, we started a little bit uh, late. And what I'm going to do is take a couple of the questions that have been asked uh, from the audience and put them together. And I'm going to start with you, Nicholas, but then open it out to uh, Simona and to, uh, Sir John. And the question is this, Britain as a country loves innovation. We've told that the government is now going to go for high risk, potentially high reward uh, innovation. How do you see the tension between trying new stuff, which has the potential of not working terribly well uh, over time, and putting in place the infrastructures and in energy and transportation that are almost guaranteed to deliver what we need. Uh, how do you see that challenge and how might it best be uh, tackled? So, Nicholas, first to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe that um, you have to look at wh where you're going to put your money effectively. If you've got, a, you've, got a, um, you've got obviously a, fin a finite pot of, of money that needs to be invested. There is clearly a range of things that can be invested in in this country, which are going to be of considerable benefit to the society as a whole. But you, like anybody, you, if you look at a portfolio, you have to also look at the opportunities where you can potentially get a better return that can get uh, a system moving faster because you can get um, more technology that is able to, to address issues um, far quicker by, but you have to split the pot up. So you've got to take say 10% of the money and put it there and 90% and put it in what you really need for the current developments. Useful advice, thank you. And Simona, this tension between sort of old stuff that works and new stuff that might do and, and perhaps give us exponentially greater benefits if it does work, how do you view that? I completely agree with uh, what uh, was just said. Uh, I have very little to add. I think we need to do both. Uh, it will be short-sighted to just uh, keep uh, reproducing the existing solutions without thinking about the new. Equally, it will be probably racy to just put all the eggs into the new stuff basket and what if then eventually they don't work. So I think it's a matter of equilibrium and balance. And, you know, I think that is also one of the things that in the UK have been happening fairly well. We have much more to be done, but I completely agree with what... Uh, 
you've just said. Thank you. And and so, John, if I can just talk, turn to you and, and raise the same question, but also uh, link in a question that has also been raised by a number of people, which is not surprisingly around carbon pricing and carbon taxes. Uh, this balance between old and new, and then what would you like to see government do on the carbon front? Well, in terms of the balance between old and new, the challenge here is, of course, the length of time it takes to develop significant infrastructure. And you've got a real dilemma, because if you want to be certain that you're going to build something which is going to work and is going to work for the next 35 years, then, in fact, you are not going to take a decision to build something which is essentially only relatively untested and untried. You can only do that in small, smaller elements. So I think if you're if you're looking at the majority of what you have to provide, so if you look at the bulk of the energy that is going to be required in, say, 15 years' time, then the investments you make today are going to be on the technology which you know and trust today. Um, there will be a proportion which you can allocate and you'll take a risk on new technologies. But I think to a certain extent, a lot of this is going to be marginal improvements which give you better and better performance as you develop on an existing technology. Um, it's very difficult um, to do something which is new. Uh, I, when I did High Speed One, my British colleagues wanted, to, um, wanted us to have our own power, overhead power system for the high speed trains, to which I said, not likely, guys. It works in France. We'll use the French one. I'm not going to risk you developing a new one. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, I want reliability at the end of the day, and I want resilience. So we've been gifted another five minutes. So uh, can you just then address the, the carbon uh, issue, pricing, taxation, what you'd like to ask government to be doing there? And then I'll roll it out to the other two panellists as well. Well, I, th I think the government simply should... <sighs> should primarily focus on what it wants to be the, the reduction. How we achieve that reduction is it can be in, in multiple different ways. And it's up to the private sector to respond to government and say, well, this is what we would like in order for us to, uh, to invest. I mean, just le leaping in with a very significant price in the, uh, in the cost of carbon. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't frankly think carbon offsets, for example, is the way that we should go. Carbon offset carbon offset is an excuse for not doing what you should really be doing. Mm. What you should really be doing is focusing on putting in place systems in the UK which are not going to generate high levels of carbon. That's what we should be doing. And the Thank government should set, so should set a goal for 10 years' time, 20 years' time, 30 years' time. That's clear. Uh, Simona, what, what about your views on that? I think uh, there are two elements that are very important. Uh, number one is to make sure that the country doesn't inadvertently uh, jump into further deindustrialization as a result of the net zero trajectory. Because, uh, of course, you know, we can always uh, assume that we can manufacture whatever we need, including our ele electrons, by the way, outside and bring it in with a cable or with something. So this is, uh, this would be Two problems. Number one, of course, uh, we wouldn't be really addressing the issue of emissions. But most importantly, you know, um, we would be failing to really take control of our destiny and also to, you know, uh, um, you know, create value, local value for, for the people in the UK. Uh, so um, I think this is an interesting dimension because sometimes, uh, you know, uh, pure economists approach uh, can uh, sometimes maybe oversee some of these aspects, where, where, whereas uh, I think these are uh, very important aspects together with the cost to the final consumers and many other things for sure. Uh, but these are very important dimensions, and I, I, and I think post-COVID crisis, etc., uh, the, the the perception of the importance of these aspects uh, has grown even even further. Thank you very much. And Nicholas, over to you. And I want to strap on an additional question for you, which is one of the questions that came from the audience was, how do batteries fit into a circular uh, economy? And I think you've you've got into elements of the second life uh, part of that, but a brief answer on that too would be very helpful. Yeah. Okay, so just picking up on, on, the, on, the, on the carbon thing, I absolutely agree with what Simone's saying. I think it's very easy 
uh, to do the carbon pricing in such a way that you end up seeing industry moving outside the country and being established elsewhere. And then effectively all we end up doing is re-importing carbon that's been created elsewhere. So I think that's a really dangerous route to go down. I also believe that frankly, if you don't structure um, these carbon pricing, they then become a sort of large trading uh, system and they can be gamed uh, by people who perhaps don't actually have any connection at all with the original creators of the carbon or the people who are, who are producing less carbon. And I think that that can become a difficulty. So I'd much prefer to see more government support in areas where the actual people who have got to do uh, address these issues themselves are getting the right government support in, in order to do so. So that's one thing. Going to your question about the circular economy, we absolutely see that batteries are very much part of the circular economy and we're very excited that we've got hold of some uh, second life batteries from uh, buses in Europe rather than in, in China and we're putting those together currently uh, with a partner in the Netherlands. Um, and that absolutely demonstrates the value of being able to extend the life of these um, assets in such a way that you can get another three or four years worth of income from them. Clearly, at some point, they're not going to be able to be used um, for any further applications. But if you imagine that today, if you took a, bus, a battery off a bus, as an example, after seven years of operation, it might cost you X to, uh, to, to recycle that and not be so efficient as in 10 years time, because you've got that extra three years, you've got that extra income and you've got the, uh, probably a much more advanced recycling system that's in place. So I think that we see, and, and we all know that 99% of the batteries can now be, be, um, be recycled in any case, but it's just quite expensive. So that system will develop. Thank you very much. And um, I just wanted to say thank you to Patrick, to Martina, uh, to Neil, uh, among the people who've uh, submitted questions that I've uh, endeavoured to ask. There's another one which I'm... Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, uh, so I was just running through some of the people who had uh, asked questions which I've endeavoured to ask the panellists. There was one more which I'm just going to mention in passing, uh, which is how did the panellists reconcile the UK's commitment to net zero with current government policies, which take us, this in brackets, in the opposite direction. Is it a case of invest for net zero, but not yet? This came from Nick Murray, who's a councillor at um, uh, Wiltshire Council. Now, I, I don't want people to answer that, but I'm, I'm just gonna say in conclusion that I end this session feeling actually rather more optimistic and upbeat about the potential for greening uh, the recovery than I began it, particularly in, in the energy and to some degree in the transportation sectors. So uh, before I ha hand over to Nick going again, I just want to say thank you, Sir John. Thank you, Simona. Thank you, Nicholas, for your uh, contributions. It's a frustrating format, but I think we managed to get uh, quite a lot of information across in uh, pretty short order. So thank you very much. I look forward to the rest of this uh, session. And Nick, I hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, it may be frustrating, but actually, it's better than not talking at all. So at least we've <laughs> we've, we've we've been we've aired we've aired many of these issues. I'm sure, like me, a lot of people are taking a lot of notes, even if they don't particularly want to ask questions. But I was very struck by the candid nature and also the positive nature of what's coming down the track and the speed at which it's coming. So thank you to all of you and to John as well. Thank you. And it's something we want to pick up uh, uh, in a moment with other speakers as well. I'm going to be talking in a moment to uh, John, uh, to Tom Rivet Karnak, who is the founding partner of Global Optimism, and of course the author with um, Christiana Figueres of The Future We Choose. So we're coming to Tom in about uh, a minute, so stay with us. Uh, grab yourself a glass of water or a sustainable cup of coffee or whatever, or a glass of orange juice, and stay with us. And please keep the questions coming. Some of the questions you asked to John's session, I'll be putting to Tom as well. Stay with us. <laughs> 